my pancreas and what you would do for me, you do for others. And so, Father, we declare over Cody that his pancreas is whole and healed and restored. We command his, his pancreas to produce the insulin his body needs, and we command his cells to receive. We thank you, Father, in advance that his A1C levels are normal in Jesus' name. feel like I need to give a testimony about Jonna. You know, she's really been battling, uh, it's called immune disorder neuropathy, and it, it's affected her nervous system where her blood pressure wants to drop and she can get up and she has to keep a walker in case she falls. She's, she's been going to five ologists. I start counting the ophthalmologist where she's getting it. She was getting an injection in her eyes and they told her probably eight she got three. She went last week, and he said, your eyes are doing awesome. He said, for a di diabetic, they shouldn't even be doing that great. You're in the top 10%. Praise report. <laughs> last week, she really wasn't even able to walk through the house. She had to keep a walker. And she was waiting on this. Uh, the cardiologist wanted this blood pressure medicine that comes from a pharmaceutical house. It doesn't come from a drugstore. So she was waiting on that. Until then, she was pretty much just falling down. She'd have to end up on the seat of the walker. But praise God, she got the medicine, but even before she got the new medicine, she was just better. And then there's a name for that. It starts with an S, and I can't pronounce it. But uh, And, of course, the urologist was concerned about her bladder because it was hard for her to go ahead and release, you know, urinate, and with her intestine also. And, she, I mean, she's been 56, 70% improved with all of that. God is healing her. She's a walking miracle. Yeah. Mr. Kurt. Howdy. So, uh, yeah, I just uh, wanted to get up in here and say that uh, come August, I'm going to be a daddy. <laughs> Amanda is the mother. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, praise God. <laughs> Another child of God being born. Amen. Uh, at this time, I'd just like to lift uh, Pastor uh, Richard up in prayer. And uh, those of you that know where you live, I'd just like to stretch your hand in that direction in agreement and prayer with me. So, Father, I just come to you, lift up Pastor Richard. I just pray that uh, you clear up the sinuses, you clear up the lungs, any, anything that is respiratory there, Father, that it must go in your name, Father. It has no place in his body, Father. He is still healed by you, Father. And I just thank you for that healing, and we claim that healing for Mr. Richard that he starts feeling better just right now, that he feels these prayers flowing into his body and driving that uh, sickness out, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello. There we go. All right. <laughs> oh. Well, you guys are the brave ones. You got up early today. I think the other ones might have got up late and they looked around, to, you know, too embarrassed to walk in, and I can understand that. I, and come on, computer. All right. 
Janie and I got to go, well, I got to go to two revival services. I went to a Methodist church, the church I got saved in, and uh, then I went to Cross Tabernacle uh, yesterday morning. And um, the guy at the Methodist church was saying that we, that the, the church needed more fire. <laughs> Amen? And then he told a story <clears throat> about his particular denomination, so it's legal. I can tell it, so. I'm bad with jokes. My mom, I remember the last time I think she was here, she, I, I started to say, I'm going to tell a joke, and she said, oh, no, you can't. You don't know how to tell a joke. But I'll never forget that. It's not like I have, you know, it's deep, hidden problems. But anyway, um, so... He said, he said there was this church, and it was, it was not very live, and there was a, there was a, a man in there who uh, his wife looked over, and he stopped breathing, and she said, I think, I think he died. I think he's dead, and they called the ambulance, and it said they had to go through 14 people before they figured out which one had actually died because they all <laughs> appeared that way. All right, so anyway. It was a lot funnier when he told it, but anyway. I know several of you weren't here last week. And uh, so I'm going to just do a, a real quick recap, and then we're wanna, I want to get into some practical things. This is, today is not my normal, because uh, I'm going to give you some things to jot down, and it's a little bit more detailed than I normally would do, but how many of you were not here last week? Okay, one, two, not, not, not too many. I, one thing I said last week that was really it dawned on me. We talk about what the Spirit, when He manifests in us, we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness. But these are actually, all of these things came out of Satan. He is the originator. So things like fear. Satan is the most, the most feared, not feared, but fearful person in the universe. He, he worries more than anyone in the universe. He carries rage and, and envy unforgiveness, anxiety, selfishness, manipulation, pride, rejection, bitterness, offendedness, self-pity, criticalness, jealousy, rebelliousness, strife, division, excuses, impatience, and blaming. And the reason I brought this out and kind of the reason the Lord pointed it to me is so much of the time we say, well, that's, that's our old nature. That's just, well, see, that old nature didn't exist in the garden. Amen? When you got born again, that stuff, you became a brand new person all over. And so when those things manifest in you, you got to recognize that's not who you really are. Because the enemy will try to convince you, well, you know, you're just impatient. You know, that's just who you are. And the enemy loves for us to do that because then we don't do anything with it. Or we physically try to work and do more, and we get frustrated in it because it's not about being. It becomes about doing. Everybody get that? Okay. Now, we, we looked at 1 Corinthians 13. Yeah, okay, let's go there first. And it said... In the whole long list of what love is, it says it's not rude, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. In other words, love, the kind of love that God talks about, it's, it's about caring for someone else, love tears up the list. Now, if, if you find yourself, you know how the enemy will come and, and tap on your shoulder and say, don't you remember what they did? He wants you to think about that and dwell on it because it'll take you places away. It'll suck the peace out of you. It'll suck the joy out of you. Um, I, uh, I've told this story lots of times, but I'll tell it again because um, it's just, it works and it's true. <coughs> there was a time in my life, there was a, a person who was actually a relative, sort of, and uh, they'd caused a lot of grief in my personal family and, uh, you know, just manipulate things. And I, I could get really angry thinking about what they'd done. Has anybody ever had anybody like that in your life? I'm not the only one, okay? So 
you know, years pass, and, and, uh, and you guys have heard this. I'm out weed eating. The person is hundreds of miles away. They're not, like, in the next door. And one thought comes in about what that person did. And I let it stay there, and then another thought comes in. Now, that's not me. That's the enemy wanting to rehearse that in my mind. And you all, we've all been there because there's this downward spiral. Well, for me, it was like a spiral up into a rage. And I got so mad. Somebody that's not anywhere close that I haven't seen probably for months, I get so mad, I take the weed eater and I throw it clear across the yard. I'm a born-again Christian, spirit-filled. Amen? And, and it had to get to that level before I even realized what was going on. And so I, I purposed to forgive them and release them. But you know what? Just because I did that, and it was a choice, and we'll talk more about that, is that that same, that same demon, and I believe it is, came and knocked on the door again and said, do you remember? And so I would say, I refuse to listen to that in Jesus' name. And you know that thing was so devious that it would come, and I, I used to work for the state, and I worked in an office that had a bunch of little cubicles, and so everybody was pretty close, and there was like seven or eight of us there. Here comes the knock with all these people around. It's like, I'm going to intimidate you with this because you can't do anything with it. And I won't, I'll hurt your ears. But I screamed, in the name of Jesus, I command you to go. It got real silent around me. <laughs> People quit working for a while. But the thing I learned is when you have that, wh whether it's a temptation or something like that, and the enemy comes, that knock gets less and less. And, and, and I, don't, I don't know this is actually true, but in my mind's eye, I, 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 I perceive this, is that, it's like that demon comes and knocks, and when you use the name of Jesus, it's like you thump him upside the head, and he takes off. And after a while, he doesn't want to come around again. And you, and, you need, and you renew your mind with what the Word says. Okay. We looked at a couple scriptures, and I'll just do these real quick. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievance you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. If you're born again, that's what it's saying to you. Amen? So those sins that the enemy tries to bring up, those, those, those things that you've messed up in the past, and he tries to, that's not God talking. And I don't believe it's you talking. I believe it's the enemy. And you can't, you can't allow those things to stay there. We talked about how much the Lord wants us free and forgiven, not just forgiving others, but even forgiving ourselves. And, and there's this example, um, two of them. 1 Corinthians 4, Paul talking about himself. He says, but with me it's a small thing that I should be judged by you or by human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. Paul's saying with all the people that he had killed and slaughtered, I'm not. I don't judge myself because he understands he's a new creature and all that's passed away. He's become, he's the one who wrote 2 Corinthians 5.17. He knew what that meant. Okay. And then I thought it was really interesting in Mark 16 because Jesus knows that, that Peter had denied him. And he says, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you, going before you into Galilee, that there you will see him as he said to you. In other words, he's saying, I know Peter is susceptible to not showing up because he really messed up. But tell the disciples, but, but tell Peter. He, he wants him to be free. He doesn't want him to stay in, in unforgiveness toward himself. Amen? And there's this, this passage that's really familiar. It says there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Now, we talk of that a lot about because we all deal with fear in different forms and fashions. And we recognize 
that love, knowing that we're loved, it, it causes fear to dissipate. The enemy tries to manipulate us with this. God is love. It's not what he does. It's just who he is. And, and sometimes when we have a hard time forgiving ourselves, we're afraid if we let ourselves off the hook. And perfect love casts out fear. God, when Jesus went to the cross, he died not only for your sins, but he died for you not only to be forgiven, but for you to forgive yourself and to forgive others and to forgive God. Because sometimes, sometimes we, we get upset with God. I don't know if you've ever done that. It's a dumb thing, but I've done that, been there. And understand this whole thing. I'll go to Hebrews 12 real quick. Am I going too fast? I, are, are y'all awake? Do we need to pass out more coffee? <laughs> <laughs> Hebrews 12, verse 15 says, Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Now, does everybody know what grace means? We say favor, but that's a really not a very good translation. It's far more than that. Grace allows you to do what you can't on your own. It allows you to step into all that God has. If, if what you think God wants you to do, you can do on your own, then it's, it's, it's probably not God. He asks us to do things like forgiveness, and he'll help us with that. But he says here, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. And he's saying here, you know, when you get into bitterness, guess what? Grace just left the place. What God has to empower you to overcome, to do the impossible, bitterness will just push that aside. Now, it says trouble, and I, I, I put this up there because it, it is to crowd in to annoy. Bitterness creeps into all kinds of areas of your life. Have you ever noticed that? In fact, it will not only affect you, it will affect maybe your spouse, your kids, the people that you work with. We might not recognize it as bitterness, but have you ever seen somebody that just goes off on a consistent basis? Oftentimes, it's the root of it. And then it says, defile, to, to taint, or I like, it, I like that last one, to contaminate. Because you, your soul becomes contaminated with it. It's got really quiet. I want to look to, this week, I want to look at uh, a passage in Matthew 18. It's a parable that you all are familiar with. But I want you to, if you have your Bible or your phone, I'd like for you to look at it other than just up here. Um, it says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay his master, his, able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him and saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Now, I'm not a rocket scientist when it comes to math. I like math. But I just started calculating this out. <laughs> So a talent's 57 pounds, but he owed, he owed 10,000. So we're looking at 570,000 talents. Now, times 16 ounces, and I'm saying if this was silver, probably was. It could have been gold. The guy owes like $164 million. <laughs> now, I want you to understand, Jesus, if you've ever noticed in his parables, he makes things so extreme. Now, what the guy owes, the other, what the guy, you know, here, let's go on. I'm getting ahead of myself. Here, let's. Then the master of the servant was moved with compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. 
But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servants fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. Now, what he owed, this guy owed him was somewhere between five and $10,000. He was just forgiven a debt of $164 million. Are you getting the picture? Okay, this extreme. So when his fellow servants saw, excuse me, saw what he had been done, they were grieved and came and told their master all that he had been done. Then his master, after he called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity? on you and his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him so my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses that's Jesus talking guys and I don't believe the torture that he's talking about is what we would call hell I believe the torment is here do you know how many people are in psych wards that have unforgiveness? Do you know how many people are on all kinds of drugs that you can't imagine have unforgiveness and bitterness? Huge. Most of the issues that, you know, physically are, are related to what well, psychosomatic issue, you know, things that, that people are holding on to. And there is torment in unforgiveness. Amen? And his intent, his intent here is, is that here's this huge debt that, that the Lord forgave us. And no matter how difficult a thing it may seem to you, it is so small in comparison to what God forgave you. Isn't it interesting that Jesus, when he was on the cross, and he was taking all your sins on you, or on him for you, as you actually. At the very last, when the enemy, and you know the enemy had to be screaming, because here's these people pointing fingers and saying all kinds of stuff. If you're really, if you're really the king, if you're really the Messiah, then you do this. And you know how easy that would have been for him to come down and just call down, you know, a few thousand angels could have wiped out things pretty fast. But he says, Father, forgive them. He refused to let the enemy have a place in him. And he refused to hold something over somebody else that would hold them in some kind of bondage. You know, one of the things with this, this story that seems really strange is, how could this guy be so dumb? <laughs> And Fred Grewey made the statement one time, and I think it's, it's, it's very possible. Is this man who'd been given this huge debt of $164 million didn't really believe it was forgiven. He still believed he owed. He, he believed that guy was going to come after him and, and expect more, so he's out beating the bushes trying to get some money so that guy doesn't put him in prison. Oftentimes, people have a difficult time forgiving don't really believe that they're forgiven. Amen? It says, as far as the east is from the west, he's forgiven. God will never bring up stuff from the past of things he's already forgiven. The few things that I know that God brings up is there's, there's things that we've held on to that we don't even know are there. And God, in his kindness, We'll bring them up. You know, the guys in Sozo do a wonderful job with that. You guys have heard this story. You know, God is so faithful. <laughs> I mean, he's so faithful. Again, here's another one of Ray's stories that you've heard several times, but you ever had, you've had a splinter, and if you don't do something, it just, it just grows and grows and grows. And You know, the Lord wants us completely free, and sometimes... 
there are things under the surface that we don't know about. I don't, I don't encourage people to go on a witch hunt looking for stuff because it's, it, you become preoccupied with you, and, you know, there's just not that much down there. <laughs> you need to look up. You know, he's got all the resources. He's got, he knows how things ought to be. But, uh, you know, years ago, I think I told this not very long ago, but years ago, uh, we met a couple from southern Illinois, went and ate breakfast at their house with them. And uh, this lady's, the lady, they have a friend there from Cal, or I'm sorry, from Florida that, that ate breakfast with us. And so, like I always do, I ask questions. You know, I say, so, you know, where are you from? And yeah, what'd you do for a living? And, and uh, just a quick rewind, when I was, when I was in kindergarten, I, uh, I was in a class and we were in the gymnasium. Y'all remember this story? And we were square dancing. Can you imagine kindergartner square dancing? But anyway, this one kid trips me, and I fall over and knock somebody else down, and the teacher thought I did it on purpose. So she tells me and this other girl, you go back to the room by yourself and stay there. Now, we, we didn't think about doing that today, but back then you just did that. Well, I, I ran away from school. I went back by the class, but then I went the front door, and I took off. And and my aunt caught me about three blocks from the stri- from the from the school on my way home, running home, and she gets me out, and she gives me a whipping, and then my dad, when he gets home, I get a whipping, and then when I go back to school, I get the third, you know, everything in threes, it's just wonderful, so, so I'm, I'm sitting here crossing this lady, you know, and she said, I said, so what did, you know, what did you, she said, well, I was a teacher, and I said, well, well, uh, what grade do you teach, she said, kindergarten, and I said, what school did you teach at, or, you know, ask her pure, she was in pure, in King, came in grade school, and, and as God is my witness, I realized this is the woman who did that. And what's really weird, I'm born again, I haven't seen this lady in like forever, I feel this anger rise up. I'm, isn't that wild? Yeah, but it was there, and I didn't even know it, but the goodness of God allowed that to happen. And so it's coming up, and and I tell her about it, and she's just, you know, besides, just, you know, please forgive me, I, you know. But there was a part of me that didn't want to do it. I mean, I can feel myself gagging on it just a little bit. Nelson Mandela said something really interesting. and He said, if you hate someone, you've given them your heart and your mind. And you have. And the enemy is so slick at doing that. He deceives us so well. It's interesting in the Lord's Prayer that Jesus includes us. And this prayer is a daily prayer. Like we might need to forgive somebody more than once. We might need that, you know, that that possibility might come pretty regularly. Not just a person, but it could be different situations. And he says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Amen? And then at the end of the, after he has what we call the Lord's Prayer, he reminds us again, he said, For if you forgive men for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. See, when we, when we refuse to forgive remember there was the law, the Old Testament, and then there's grace? Grace is receiving, uh, and mercy, I should say, forgiveness for, for uh, all that we've done, and we don't deserve it. We, we receive this one, you know? But under the law, if you did wrong, you got, you got bad because you deserved it, right? You know, whether you got something cut off or you or whatever so so when I judge you <laughs> I'm saying okay I, I want you to be under the law again I'm judging you I'm saying this isn't right you, you deserve this when I do that I put myself back under the law and and I get all this stuff comes with it 
Is that making sense to everybody? I don't know about you, but I, I don't want that. <laughs> Jesus paid a price for me to be free. So there's a term that R.T. Kendall phrase that says total forgiveness. I don't know how you get sort of kind of forgiveness, but total forgiveness. And, he, and here's a list of things. So what, what forgiveness or total forgiveness is not, because sometimes in, in Christians get a little weird. You know, they take it, we have a tendency to take things farther than, than God necessarily intended. So if I forgive you, it's, it's not approval of what you did. In other words, it's, I'm not saying that what you did was okay. It's not excusing what you did. It's not saying, you know, no problem. It's not justifying what they did, like you had a right to do this, and therefore, no. No. It's not pardoning what they did in the sense of if, if somebody did something legally wrong, it doesn't mean that they're going to get out of it. If someone, if someone abused a child, maybe it's your child, I will forgive them, but it doesn't mean that I'm freeing them up from what the legal consequences are. It's not reconciliation. It doesn't mean that you, that you have to go on vacation with them. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Sometimes we think, we think in forgiving somebody, we've got to make everything okay. You know, and, it's, and you can't force somebody else to do, to forget. You are the one who chooses to forgive. You, you, you've heard my story about the pastor who I got, got really mad at angry because he he stood in a pulpit and he lied and it was and he lied about my wife to try to make himself look better and I felt pretty justified being mad <laughs> and uh and we didn't leave the church I mean later on but we didn't leave the church over that because the Lord didn't tell us to go you know when you leave church it's not because you got offended it's what God said to so Later on, the Lord told me to go and apologize to him. And I'm not, I'm really not encouraging people to do that. Because sometimes, you know, you may, you may have hold uh, an offense against somebody that doesn't even know it. And you go in and apologize and just stir stuff up in them. But in this case, the Lord told me to go do it. And I didn't want to do it. I hadn't done anything wrong. That's why I told God. And he wouldn't relent because he knew he wanted me free. And it was on my brain a lot. And I, 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 I drove to his house. <laughs> and I went by his house and drove around the block. And I went by his house again. <laughs> I drove around the block. And finally, I parked in front and went inside. And here's the thing. I apologized to him. And I really expected that he would do the same. But he didn't. But I was free. It's not based on whether they reciprocate. It's not denying what they did. It's not pretending like that never happened. And it's not blindness or even forgetting in the sense of it just never did. The, the Lord wants us to, to tear it up and not deal with it, but it's not like I'm just brain dead and that never really happened. Uh, it's it's refusing. It's, it is not refusing to take the, the wrong seriously, and it's not pretending like you weren't hurt. Okay. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 44, But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. A wonderful passage, amen? <laughs> you know, we grit our teeth, but remember, everything the Lord ever put His, He wants to keep us free. And I just want to do, we're going to do a few of these. What total forgiveness is, and then we're going to give some practical. It's being aware of so, what someone has done and still forgiving them. It is... Am I going too fast? 
It is choosing to keep no record of wrongs. It's a choice. You know, love is a choice. You know, when we read 1 Corinthians 13, we think we, we have a tendency because of our culture that it's like I have this warm, fuzzy feeling to do those. And sometimes love is making that choice because I know it's right and I want good and I want to please God and it doesn't matter. It's not about feelings. Forgiveness is refusing to punish. I'm not talking about the legal sense of it, but you personally. It's not telling what they did. This is a biggie in the body of Christ. And everybody probably in this room has been guilty, including me. And as, I, as I've been chewing on this for, a, for about a month, um, realized, had to, to deal with that. Because you see, sometimes, like we said at the very beginning, you know, we have a tendency to tell people because we want them to look bad and we want to look good. Forgiveness is being merciful. What my my grandson Matthew, who's five, four, is he four? He's four. What was his definition of mercy? <laughs> uh, hold on. I got. You turn that on, okay? My, well, my sister will be seventy this year, and she took him shopping. This little four-year-old. It's her favorite thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> and he, his parents don't take him shopping very much, so he was kind of like, you know, wow, look at all this stuff, and and so he was running here and running there. She said, "Mercy me, you're killing me." <laughs> and he stopped and he looked at her, and he said, uh, "Mercy." Is that's oh why I dear. asked you to come up here. Oh no, <laughs> I forgot what he said. Mercy too. is giving okay. a person another chance. Is that was that the mercy? Yeah, or he said there's a difference between mercy and yeah, he and defined mercy and grace yeah. and forgiveness. He's a theologian, we're just we're just <laughs> and no, he said one well, one of them was giving a person a second chance when they don't deserve it. And it was like she was just kind of stunned. <laughs> oh, my God, because she was using it glibly, you know. And he's like, no, it's serious. You know, like it's serious. <laughs> <laughs> Forgiveness is graciousness, not severely judging. It is gentleness. And forgiveness is an inner condition of the heart. Bitter, I'm sorry, forgiveness is the absence of bitterness. And forgiveness is forgiving God. And it's forgiving yourself. Okay, now I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and put these up because I think they're really good. What unforgiveness manifests? It begins with resentment when a person holds a grudge and becomes inwardly bitter. You know, they did something to me or some of mine. And you know, can you can you just hear the voice of the enemy in this? They don't want someone to get away with it. They want them to be exposed. I heard a fellow given a testimony and he talked about that you know you, you better repent repent constantly all the time and that you know because God was going to expose you and it not it's really not the heart of God it says love covers a multitude of sins it's the enemy that's the accuser of the brethren right but it leads to us going over and over in our mind what they did. It's rehearsing it over and over. That, that's what the enemy wants. He wants to suck the life out of you. He wants the, your eyes to get off of the Lord and to get on that. Amen? And, and 
and we become preoccupied with hate and self-pity. They're kind of like twin sisters. And you know, some people, because they don't know who they are in the Lord, feel like the only attention they deserve is pity. And they always go around, woe is me. And that's, that will never take the place of being loved unconditionally. And that's the way the Lord loves us. And it'll lead to, it'll lead to want to get even, to take revenge. Now, if you're a Christian, you won't say that, but you'll do it in other ways. <laughs> Getting back at them through, you know, manipulation, all kinds of stuff. And you get in that place where you, they need to pay like the fellow we read about who was forgiven a, a great debt. They need to pay. I got hurt, so they need to pay. And one of the ways that they get even is tell what you know about them that makes them look bad. Right? And making a choice to not forgive shows we really aren't grateful for God forgiving our sins. You see, you see, if you put yourself in a position where God has already forgiven, the Bible says He's already forgiven everybody. It doesn't mean you're born again. We actually have to accept Him. But He's already paid the price. So if God's forgiven them and I say, I'm not forgiving you because... You've elevated yourself. In fact, it's a really it's a form of idolatry because you're saying, I'm smarter, better than God at what's, what's right and what's wrong, and this is what's owed even though he says not. Got really quiet. Now, this is scriptural whether you like it or not, but the part is, and I don't want to teach it like that, but the deal is, is that this is a way that the enemy has, has gotten the body of Christ off into just so much crap, and we stay in bondage, and, and we kind of, you know, we, we kind of keep some of that stuff in the cage, and we survive, but, but given certain circumstances, that dog comes out and bites you again, you know? Pressure gets up, somebody does something similar, and we're off to the races. The word being offended or offense, literally, it, it comes from a, being a trap set up by the enemy. Okay. What happens if we don't forgive? Here's some of the consequences. We lose fellowship with the Father. the anointing of the Holy Spirit begins to dry up in our life. Our intimacy with Christ starts going by the wayside. And we lose out on rewards that He has for us. So, how do I live in total forgiveness? This is it. I know this isn't very preachy. <laughs> okay, here we go. How do I do it? Make a deliberate and irrevocable choice not to tell anyone what they did. Now, and when I say that, I just put out this little thing. I understand that you have one person that you might share that with to help you through that, but the idea is not rehearsing it to everybody. Because the intent with that, again, is, let me tell you, you know, how bad I, I have it and how, how wonderful I am and how terrible they are. Second thing, be pleasant to them should you be around them. It doesn't mean, again, that you're going to go on vacation but when you're around them, that you're nice. You're not, Arr! If conversation ensues, say that 
which would get them free from guilt. In other words, don't bring it up. If somebody brings it up and talks about, you don't throw it in there. We're talking about total forgiveness and staying free. Look at this one. Let them feel good about themselves. Well, I want them to feel guilty. I want them to be shamed. Now, does God want you to feel that way? Does he? So he's asking us to act like he does instead of the way the enemy is. Protect them from their greatest fear. In other words, protect their greatest fear is that they'll get exposed, that people find out about them. Keep it up today, <laughs> tomorrow, and in the future. Because situations will come up. You'll have interaction with them or somebody else. The enemy knocks on that door. Maybe you had not been there a while. But it's something that you've made a decision to do. Not just today. And we talk about forgiveness being a choice, a decision. But there is a walk in it out. Now here's the great one. Pray for them and bless them. Bless them. Asking God to do good in their life. It's not like the sons of thunder said, Hey, <laughs> you must fall down, some, call out some fire on those guys and burn them on the spot. And we've all had that. I mean, because that's what the enemy wants. Jesus said, But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Do good. And pray for those who spitefully use you. In other words, they, they continue to bring stuff up. They continue to make it difficult. Right? And persecute. It's, it's not like putting yourself out there just to get thumped all the time. That's not the, the idea. There, there's a thing called boundaries that you put up that you don't necessarily around that person in your life, you know, up close and personal all the time. But you continue to bless them and pray for them. Now, here's the thing that Jesus said that really kind of messes with us. Or maybe not you. You guys are way more spiritual than I am. But he said you're blessed when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake he said rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven a fellow said it like this every enemy that you have and an enemy the idea of an enemy is they they are purposely trying to do bad it's not somebody that you just have a disagreement but they're really trying to make make you tell people about you bad things or just whatever he said look at your enemy as a gold mine because it says you can have a great reward with them. As some would say, you get an upgrade. But there is a reward that God has. You know, isn't it amazing, people in the Bible, I think about Joseph, we talked about him last week. Think about David. All these people that, who had all kinds of bad stuff done to them, and yet they continued to forgive and not hold it against them and the Lord promoted them sometimes those difficult things are, are tests that you that you got to go to to get to where God wants you to be isn't it amazing that David at the end of Saul's life after he died and Saul how many of you got you know had somebody trying to kill you for seven years that all you've done is good to them and yet he loved him and at the end of his life, he's weeping over Saul's death. Because he kept his heart in the right place. He wouldn't allow himself to go there. Amen? We started off several weeks ago saying, reading John 17, the Lord's, what, what Jesus prayed at the very end. And he said that we would be one as he is one. It's impossible to be one without forgiveness. Whether it's at your house or in the church or wherever. 
you know? Today. Yeah, you want to, somebody come up and we'll. I can go lots of places, but it's late and I've preached really long today. And I'm glad that that many of you wrote that stuff down. Because it's a position, it's, it's a way to stay in forgiveness and not to be susceptible to the con of the enemy. I want you all just to bow your head for a second. And I, I, I just want you to be honest. Don't go on a witch hunt. But is there somebody that the Lord's put on your mind or heart that you need to forgive? And is that person yourself? God doesn't want us to shame other people, expose other people, nor does he want to do that to you. That's not his intent. His intent is for us to live free. So if you need to make a decision today, I just encourage you, even right now, just verbally to say, Lord, I I forgive them. I choose to forgive them. I let go. And Lord, I'm asking for help. I'm asking for your grace to do what Ray just talked about. To not tell people about it. To treat them good. To to pray and to bless them. Because it will take your grace to do that. But I choose to forgive And I believe, Lord, you give me the grace to do that. Now, before you stand and and we dismiss, I just, there will be people up here, ministry team, would be happy to pray with you. I encourage you. If there's somebody like that, I found it's really powerful if you express that forgiveness to another person and they say, you know, Lord's put this on and I just want to release him today. And there's something about that, that person that I share that with, they pray for me and they, they rehear or repeat what God would say that you're forgiven. tell you what, it is the most freeing thing. And also know that the Lord is going to be there in the days ahead to keep you in that place, to keep you free. Would you stand on your feet? Father, I just thank you this morning for your kindness and your mercy. I thank you, Lord, that you are full of compassion. You're full of grace and you're full of mercy. And Lord, today we just we want, to, we want to keep grace in our life, Lord. We want to let those things just slide off of us, Lord, and to look up and not get focused on this stuff that we've, we've allowed ourselves and the enemy to rehearse. But, Lord, you want us, you died for us to live free. And for us to do that, to live free, we have to free others. And so, Father, I pray, Lord, if, for each person here to do that, And, Lord, many here don't even have an issue with that. But, Lord, I know that there's opportunities in the future. And, Lord, I'm just asking, God, that you'll remind us of that. If we find ourselves rehearsing to to people about what somebody has done to us or all that, God, that you'll remind us of this message, Lord, and we shut it down. And, Lord, that in that moment we'll turn and we'll begin to pray for that person and bless them. God, we're just so grateful for that. We're so grateful that you did that for us. You released us. You freed us. And then you're so good that you said, I'll help you do the same with others. Thank you, Lord, for doing that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you need prayer, go over there. There's the...
guys going on the mission trip or meeting downstairs.